This weekend, we might see the biggest conference rivalry in the modern D1 wrestling era, with Penn State wrestling the historic Hawkeye wrestling team. Both teams are undefeated on the year in duels. Both teams won their pool collegiate duels, and both teams have All-Americans going up and down their lineup. But I don't want to hype up this weekend too, too much, and we could talk about all the juicy action at the end of this video, and in the detailed recap coming out early next week. But for now, I thought it would be interesting to look at the rivalry a little deeper. Because for those of you that don't know, I always have been a thorn in Kale Sanderson's side for what feels like forever now. Kale never really could beat Iowa when he was at Iowa State, so when he took his talents to Happy Valley, how did it fare for him? Well, for those who don't know, I think this will be a great video to detail the history of the Iowa vs. Penn State dual rivalry, all within the Kale Sanderson era. I think some of these results will refresh the memory of some hardcore wrestling fans, highlight some former studs from both teams, and to put into perspective that sometimes you don't have to have the best dual team to win a national title in March. Now, with everyone super excited to hear a history lesson on the Penn State vs. Iowa rivalry, all within the Kale Sanderson Penn State era, what's going on everyone? My name is Tanner, and this is True Tan Wrestling. I primarily make dual and tournament recaps, college wrestling retrospectives from time to time, and breaking news stories all within the D1 college wrestling space. If any of that sounds interesting to you, consider hitting that subscribe button, and if you end up liking this video, feel free to hit that like button too. If you have any questions throughout, I would love to hear what you have to say in the comment section below. Now, let's dive into this beast. Also, follow me on Twitter for channel updates. Now, let's really dive in. <laughs> As mentioned, Kale Sanderson left Iowa State, his alma mater, after the team finished third at Nationals, and leading the charge that year in team points was, of course, the Iowa Hawkeyes. Considering he wrestled for Iowa State, I think it's safe to say he's probably not the biggest Hawkeye lover. His move to Penn State was shocking and took the wrestling world by storm, and most people were wondering how quickly could he shift Penn State to a dominant culture. And to say the least, it was a very fast transition. Kale's first year at Penn State definitely had some promise, with a national finalist at the end of the year, but we aren't here to talk about every little moment since Kale has been at Penn State. We are here to talk about one specific moment from every year Kale has been at Penn State, starting with the 2010 Iowa vs. Penn State duel. Penn State was a top 15 team, but the Hawks were once again the number one team in the nation. The duel definitely could have went better for the Nittany Lions, as they would drop this meeting 29-6. The only thing that sort of went right in this duel was Lynch actually beat Montel Mary in this match in sudden victory, and Mary would go on to be a national finalist this season. But besides that, Metcalf pinned Molinero at 149, and Valamon, a national finalist this season for Penn State, will lose the top tier Morningstar. Alright, so it was Kale's first year, and they were a double digit ranking above Iowa, so this really isn't that unrealistic in the long run. However, the next year would cause some pretty alarming concern at the time. Penn State was ranked number one, and Iowa wasn't even projected to finish in the top four this season, but they were still a top 10 team, don't get me wrong. Clearly still a big duel and a big test for Nittany Lions, but they didn't really perform up to fans' expectations. This 2011 season, Penn State would lose once again to Iowa 22-13, giving the number one team in the country their first loss, and even more pressure stacked on top of them. Returning 125 finalists long, now up at 133 for Penn State, would lose to Ramos of Iowa, who would go on to have a great season and career for the Hawkeyes. Of course, Quinn Wright would get upset here, and he would go on to win a national title at this weight class. And even the combined power of Molinero, Taylor, and Ruth, the Hawks got more bonus points and wins to close out the duel with the victory. Penn State would win Big Tens and NCAAs this season regardless, but still a crazy duel and put some things into perspective at the time. In 2012, Iowa returned to being the favorite team to win this duel, being ranked second at Penn State would be ranked third right behind them. Penn State was the returning national champs, but they dropped a match to super tough Minnesota Gophers way early in the season, so many people were skeptical if they'd get over this hump. And it did not look good early on in this duel, with Mega Ludus dropping an overtime loss to Hawkeye stud McDonough at 125, and Ramos getting a massive pin to start the Hawks 9-0, and then Montel Marion would win at 141 to extend the lead 12-0 for Iowa. Yeah, it was not looking very good as a Penn State fan, but one thing that I forgot to mention is that the 2012 team was pretty filthy, and after this rough start for the Nittany Lions, it was all Penn State as they would win the next 7 matches to finally beat the Hawks in a duel 22-12. Let me just read you their 149 to heavyweight lineup, it's crazy. Molinero at 149, national champ. Dylan Allen at 157, stud in high school and always was an All-American talk. David Taylor, two-time national champ at 165, and well, he was also a World and Olympic champ. Ed Ruth, three-time national champ at 174. Quinn Wright, two-time national champ at 184, and first four-time 
time All-American. There was McIntosh at 197, who would eventually be a national finalist and several time All-American, and Wade at heavyweight, who was a longtime starter and stud for them. However, Penn State would not go on a winning streak throughout the years because in 2013, they lost again, and it was after winning another national title and being the number one team ranked in the country. It had an oddly similar start, but like usual, Iowa just took advantage of their holes a little better than Penn State did. McDonough will once again beat Mega Lewis in overtime at 125. Ramos would get another pin, this time over soon-to-be All-American Conway at 133, and Ballweg would get a major decision for the Hawks at 141. So not looking great, but we've seen this before. However, even the combined bonus point power of Taylor and Ruth, along with Wright getting a win, the Hawks still had wins from guys like St. John, who beat Dylan Allen at 157, and longtime Iowa heavyweight and now coach Telford would get the win to seal a duel 22-16 for the Hawks. This one was honestly shocking to me. I mean, at the time it definitely was. How can a team just be so dominant in the tournament game, but then drop matches here, especially when they have guys who score crazy bonus points? But it is Iowa, and it wasn't like Penn State was losing to lower level teams. And if you haven't noticed already, this rivalry perfectly shows that matchups really matter in the dual portion of this sport, and it took a while for Penn State to be extremely good in the tournament game and really good in the dual portion of the game as well. In the 2014 season, they actually wrestled before Midlands. Not like that really matters, just thought I'd mention it. <laughs> but Penn State would win this one pretty convincingly. Keita knows that Gilman made his start here, and normally Clark was the guy this season at 125, but regardless, Gilman would wrestle Megalutis and he would drop the match there. And Rose would get another pin. <laughs> which would mark his third pin and a win over a 125 national finalist in his Penn State dual career, which is kind of an interesting stat when I look back at it. We also saw matches like McIntosh beat Sammy Brooks, who is a household name now in freestyle, along with Brown changing the tide from last season, which is a big point swing for them, beating Hawkeye celebrity Mike Evans. Also, Zane Rutherford would be a freshman this season, beating Jevo of Iowa at 141 for the Penn State victory 24-12. In 2015, yep, you guessed it, I would once again switch it to beat Penn State 18 to 12, which was pretty close since Iowa was the favorite to win it this year. Spoiler alert, they didn't though. And Penn State was sitting some massive point scores, and they lost Ruth and Taylor from the year before, but still a really competitive duel regardless. This was Sorensen's freshman year, and him and Bites would have a nice match, along with Brown once again being Evans at 174, which was actually the national semifinal this season. And Goulbon upset Clark here too, which was another semifinal, but that would switch come March with Clark getting the victory there. I talked a little bit about my love and thoughts on the 2015 Penn State team in my Penn State lineup breakdown, and to be honest, it was a great year for the NCAA landscape with a lot of different teams getting their shot, so I would go check out those old brackets if you forgot about it, especially if you are a Buckeye fan. In 2016, wait, where is the 2016 season duel? Wait, what do you, wait, what do you mean they didn't have it? Wait, what? Wait, they didn't wrestle this season? Oh my god. Sorry about that, and we are back. So in 2016, this started the trend of Iowa and Penn State sometimes not wrestling each other, and I could kind of explain this. In 2014, so the 2014-2015 season, Maryland Rutgers would join the Big Ten, making the conference even bigger and better. So normally there is one of two Big Ten teams each school doesn't wrestle, and it is rotated every year. It is the same thing in football, and I am assuming every Big Ten sport sort of does this. There simply just isn't enough time to wrestle all these duels in a season. So these new team inclusions mean sometimes we miss out on Iowa versus Penn State every couple years, and we have to kind of wait till Big Tens to sort of see it. Not saying Penn State would have won this duel, but they did beat Iowa by almost 30 points at Big Tens to win Big Tens, so... In 2017, Penn State was real on a roll, beating the Hawks 7 of the 10 matches, winning the duel 26-11. to This duel was still crazy though in Carver, with Zane rallying late to beat Sorensen in an overtime 98 match. I would go rewatch that match because it was awesome. And Mark Hall would get his redshirt pulled to lose to Meyer of Iowa, but Hall would go on to win a national title this season, so everyone who held on to his stock knows it paid off. We saw 1 versus 2 in Nolf versus Kemmer at 157, and it would not be the last time either, with Nolf winning a convincing 9 to 4 match, and Bo Nickel would pin Sammy Brooks in 38 seconds. Oh, poor Sammy. Also, Suriano versus Gilman at 125 was a low scoring match, but freshman Suriano really pushed Gilman to the edge that entire match. And would you believe the very next year in 2018, Penn State would actually win two of these duels in a row back to back years? Yeah, this lineup for Penn State might be one of the best ever, but I don't think wrestling fans need me to say that. 
This is the team with five national champs all in a row and some other strong heavy hitters, so they were not only a great duel team, but an even scarier dominant tournament team. The real scary part is that there were two monster teams in 2018, but that is a video for another day. <coughs> hint, hint, hint. But in this 2018 season, Penn State stormed past Iowa again 28-13. To be honest, their real rival these past two years were easily Ohio State, especially this season with Penn State beating them, so they were for sure beating Iowa. However, there were still some notable matches from this season. Spencer Lee wrestled this match, picking up a pin. Nick Lee got his first win over an Iowa wrestler. Marinelli would stun returning national champ Vincenzo Joseph, but Joseph would go on to win it all regardless, beating Imar once again. And Bo Nickel pinned Bowman in 50 seconds. Ouch. And giving some heavyweight love, Neville's of Penn State would also beat Hawkeye legend Sam Stoll, which was a nice win for him at the time. We had another gap year in 2019, so we look at the Big Ten results, where Penn State would win sending nine guys to the Big Show, outscoring Iowa by 50 points, and having one more qualifier than them. Iowa actually took third this season behind Ohio State in second, which is actually interesting considering the previous year and the year to come, with Penn State actually losing to both of those teams in the Big Ten tournament, Ohio State being the year before, and then Iowa of course being the year to come. In 2020, you could feel the hype surrounding this duel, and the day of was electric just thinking about it. For the first time in four years, Penn State was finally the underdog again, and I was honestly the heavy favorite. But in classic Penn State fashion, they did not go down without a fight, and they had some massive chances to win it once again. Spencer Lee would start the match for the Hawkeyes at 125 with a five point tech fall over Meredith. This might not seem great, but honestly, that one point could have made the difference in this duel. The biggest swing was RBY scoring first on DeSano, which really changed the tide of that rivalry at 133. Unfortunately, DeSano would injury default, but that totally switched the narrative of this duel, giving Penn State the lead and six points points. Also, Muren did not wrestle at 141, so Nick Lee got a bonus point tech fall win, which was huge too, and Verclaren at 149 held Lugo off from getting a major, and honestly, as a Penn State fan, it was looking very good as the duel was going on. All the wins were bonus points so far, and all the losses were basically best case scenario, especially at 157, with Young unable to get a major over Bo Pfeiffer. Then the match that could have decided the duel, at 165, we saw Marinelli versus Joseph, and I'll say it, I think Marinelli was pinned. <laughs> Just kidding. But Joseph and Marinelli had a heart stopping and heart pumping match. Then it would Joseph being the winner, making the team score 14 to 10 Penn State. I was getting pretty cocky at this point with four matches to go. <laughs> what an idiot move. There was a one versus two upset with Kemmer making a serious name for himself at his new 174 pound weight class, with Mark Hall dropping another Carver match, and that was not good for Penn State and totally switched things around. Two freshmen would battle it out with Brooks getting a nice win over Abe Assad at 184, and Assad actually beat Venza Nebraska, who was Brooks' only loss this season, and I would say Brooks rebounded super well this duel. Finally, Rasheed would drop a match to Warner at 197, and that match would actually get switched at Big Tens, and the same could be said with Hall versus Kemmer, so I guess it's better for them to win then rather than now but uh Penn State definitely could have won this duel if it was switched <laughs> finally at heavyweight Cassiope sealed the deal beating Seth Nevels who was a starter at the time since Anthony Kassar hurt his shoulder and was done for the Nittany Lions regardless Iowa would win the duel retaking the crown 19 to 17 I'll give it to Iowa they faced some massive adversity in this duel early and they made the best of it late to come out on top over a strong Penn State team we never got to see this play out in March but Iowa did win big tens in case you were wondering Wow, so I went way more in depth on that duel than the other ones, but that's just because they haven't wrestled since that 2020 duel, considering last year's duel was canceled, story of my life, but Iowa would honestly get even better with their team getting a transfer J&I around 141 and Mirren bumping up to 149. Iowa will win big 10s and win it all in March, even with Penn State getting four national champs, who are all back by the way. In conclusion, this rivalry was way more of a roller coaster than I remember. You kind of forget some of these awesome matchups between these elite teams. These duels breathe bonus points making the difference and that matchups do matter. And even if one team is ranked 10th and one is ranked 1st, neither of them is safe from the upset. With the Iowa versus Penn State duel rapidly approaching, I hope we see all 10 guys healthy and ready to battle. I know it is getting late in the season and coaches are trying to keep their guys safe and COVID free, so just stay calm wrestling fans. We always know that the wrestling stars will appear in March, and that is all we can really ask for. But I'll tell you this much, it could be 20 backups wrestling out for the number one spot in Carver Hawkeye Arena this weekend, and I will still be watching with my heart out of my chest. Also PS, I guess the brand story is airing after the duel on Big Ten Network. So check that out if you want to. Uh, maybe I'll go back to my roots and do a movie review on it or something. Uh, let me know if you'd want to see that in the comment section below. But with all that said and all my dumb jokes out of the way, I hope you all enjoyed this video. And with all that said, take care, everybody, and I will see you in the next one.
Thank you all very much.